Welcome to Have a Good Future with Kidney Disease, Part 4, Kidney Transplant. My name is Mary Beth Callahan. I'm a social worker at Dallas Transplant Institute and have worked with people with kidney disease since 1984. It's a privilege to be with you today on a part of your journey. Life is indeed a journey, and life with chronic kidney disease is a journey. You can go to different places on a journey and get there in different ways. In this session, we're going to talk about what your journey might look like with a kidney transplant. When you have a kidney transplant, a surgeon puts a new kidney in your body from a donor. Your original kidneys are above your waist, under your ribs. We think of them as being on the back side of our body. The new kidney is placed in your belly, protected by your hip. The scar is from the hip bone to the pelvis. If you have type 1 diabetes, you could talk to your transplant team about a kidney pancreas transplant. You'd get a kidney and a new pancreas. You would likely get both organs from one donor or you might have two surgeries, which might mean a pancreas after kidney transplant. Different transplant centers approach this in different ways. With a pancreas kidney transplant, there is an 80 to 85% chance that you would not need insulin or dialysis for at least one year. There's a very good chance, 70% chance, that a kidney pancreas transplant will still be working five years later. Waiting time can be shorter when you are listed for two organs. Statistics apply to groups of people, not individuals. But on average, people who have transplants live about three times longer than those who do standard in-center hemodialysis three times a week. Of course, it's not possible to randomly assign people to get a transplant or not. So we'll never know if it's the transplant, the people who are chosen, or both. A transplant feels more like having your own healthy kidneys. And what does this mean for you? If you are in good enough health to get a transplant, you have a good chance of living longer than you would with standard dialysis. Some people think that a transplant is a cure for kidney failure. Unfortunately, it is not. Even with a transplant, a person still has chronic kidney disease. If you see on the people there on the beach, the gentleman has a little red kidney where the transplanted kidney would be. It's also important to know that getting a transplant is not necessarily an all or nothing. Sometimes people have a transplant, get a transplant, and it works well enough to keep them off dialysis, but it doesn't work as well as someone else's kidney transplant might. A lot of factors go into this, and so I just think it's important to realize that getting a transplant is not about perfection. We know that you will still have chronic kidney failure. We hope that it works out better for you than dialysis, but it's not an all or nothing. Often a transplant will last for years, sometimes decades. And if a transplant fails, you will need dialysis or another transplant. So let's talk about the lifestyle you might have if your transplant works. A working transplant cleans your blood almost as well as our own kidneys did, the kidneys we were born with. This means fewer diet limits than on standard in-center hemodialysis. A dietitian will review with you specifically what will be good choices for you because remember, it's not an all or nothing situation. So your transplant may be working, but it may not be working at 100%. So there will be some choices for you and the dietitian to talk about. Transplant meds may cause you to gain weight. So having physical activity as a part of your regular lifestyle before transplant will help you to be fit after transplant. It will be part of your regular lifestyle in an ongoing way. Talk to your doctor about this even with chronic kidney disease. You may also still need to watch how much salt you eat because you will want to protect your new kidney from blood pressure issues. 
When you do standard hemodialysis in a clinic, you must follow a schedule three times a week. You need to be there at a certain time. This may be able to work around a special event like a wedding. The dialysis center will usually try, but it isn't always possible. With the transplant, you will have clinic visits, and you'll have a lot in the beginning and fewer later on. But otherwise, your time is your own. And this sounds good, but sometimes this even takes some getting used to if a person has been on standard dialysis in a dialysis center. But in the end, there's a lot of things you can do with your own time. Not everyone who gets a transplant feels well enough to work, but many do. Having a transplant gives you more time for a job. You may have more energy as well. Many even find that they think more clearly when their blood is cleaner. Having a job and a health plan for the future are very important. Medicare is in place only three years after transplant unless you are 65 or disabled for a reason other than kidney disease. Social Security considers a person potentially disabled only 12 months after transplant. This means that you want to speak to your transplant social worker within the first three months after your transplant about Social Security work incentives to help you return to work and keep Medicare for a longer period if you are not disabled for another reason other than kidney disease. There are possibilities for a good future but it does take planning. As I work with patients, I know that this can sound scary. Thinking and planning ahead can make this more doable. We're here to help you. With a working transplant, your kidney replacement is portable, so to speak. It works 24-7 and goes where you do. You do need to be careful about germs, Developing countries will not be good choices for you, but overall, transplant is the easiest treatment to travel with. Studies show that people who have transplants report fewer problems with their sex lives than those on standard dialysis. Having cleaner blood helps your whole body work better. Women have successfully had babies a year or two after a transplant as well. You would want to speak to the kidney doctor who is following your transplant to be sure the medications that you are taking do not need to be changed while you are pregnant. Sometimes men wonder if they will be able to impregnate their spouse or significant other after transplant. Our experience is yes, indeed. Before you can be cleared for transplant, you need a lot of medical tests. These include blood tests, x-rays, EKG, echo, possibly a dental exam. Your GI tract and heart will be tested to be sure you're healthy. Your kidneys, ureters, and bladder will be checked. You will meet with a social worker for a psychosocial evaluation and planning. Men will need a PSA test to check prostate health. Women will need a mammogram and a pap smear. These tests will need to be repeated depending on how long your wait is on the transplant waiting list. You will also need a plan to pay for your transplant drugs and your care. Why do you need transplant drugs? Well, the transplant is a foreign object in your body. Your immune system will attack it. The transplant drugs partially suppress your immune system, and the goal is to keep you healthy and trick your body into accepting the kidney. Doctors who work with transplant work very hard to walk this fine balance. After your transplant evaluation is complete and you have been approved by the transplant committee, you will be on a waiting list for a kidney match. Three types of matches are needed. First, a kidney must be compatible with your blood type. Then, it must match your tissue type. And finally, a kidney must be checked for a cross-match. We will look a bit deeper into each of these. Your blood type depends on antigens. Antigens are on the surface of each red blood cell. We inherit our blood type from our parents. There are four blood types, A, B, a, B, and O. You can see why type O blood is known as the universal donor. 
there are no antigens. And you can see why type AB blood is the universal recipient. Someone with AB blood can get a kidney from a donor with type A, AB, B, or O blood. It can get pretty confusing. This is a great diagram to explain it, I think. Next, there is the HLA match, also known as the human leukocyte antigen. This is about white blood cells. We inherit three HLA types from each parent for a total of six. Identical twins match for all six. This can also happen in unrelated people. There is no minimum number of HLA types that must match. A zero match kidney can work just as well, but may need more medications to avoid rejection. A cross match Test the serum of your blood plasma against a donor's red blood cells. A positive cross match means that your body is likely to attack the kidney. A negative cross match means that a transplant with that donor can go forward. And sometimes when a person is called for transplant, several people are called when a kidney come in, about three. And it's this final cross match that sometimes leads for one person to have to go home because the cross match, the final cross match, may not work. Each month, your blood will be tested against a panel of 60 HLA types. If your blood reacts to 30, your PRA, which is known as the panel reactive antibody, is about 50%. The lower your PRA, the better your chance of a negative cross match. A high PRA means that you're sensitized. That means that few kidneys would be a good match. Your PRA can change from one month to the next. There are treatments to reduce your PRA if you are sensitized, such as rituximab, IVIG, and plasmapheresis. Plasmapheresis is a blood cleaning treatment similar to dialysis. Not all of these are covered by Medicare. So that can be tricky as well when you're applying for transplant. Some things that can cause a high PRA include transfusions, previous transfusions, no matter when in your life, pregnancy, and prior transplants. If you get a transplant, you'll have medications to take every day to help keep the transplant. These medications can be costly, especially at first when there are more medicines to take. Some are now generic, which can help to reduce the cost, but it's kind of a complicated puzzle of how to get these medications paid for. But it's important to be in touch with someone from your transplant center if you are not able to get them, to be in touch with them as soon as possible. Because your immune system is suppressed, it can't protect you as well from infection or cancer. So infection or cancer are risks as long as you have a transplant. Some transplant medications also raise your risk for diabetes. As we know, any medication can have side effects. Transplant medications, and the list you see there are some of the more commonly used transplant medications, are strong drugs and therefore have side effects. These medications work together, and most people are on two or three anti-rejection medications for the life of their transplant. Again, immunosuppression is what creates the risk of infection and cancer. It's not related to any one medication, but to the overall process of immunosuppression. Some side effects will fade in time. Prednisone, when a person is first on it immediately after transplant, may be on a higher dose. And after the first six weeks, the dose is decreased. And so many of the side effects associated with prednisone will decrease greatly after that time. You may not always have some of these side effects, or you may always have the risks of some of them. The dose of some of the medicines may be able to be adjusted also so that you feel better. And during the first three to six months after transplant, this is something that I really talk to patients and their families about prior to a transplant. I think it can be a bumpy course sometimes. So to set expectations, 
there will be some tweaking that has to go on in terms of tweaking the medications. There may be a greater risk of infection. So the idea that you may have to go back into the hospital sometime within the first six months after transplant is a real possibility. And there may be a rejection episode, but that is an episode. And that does not mean that the kidney won't last for another 15 years or longer. So it's important to kind of set expectations that the first three or four months can be bumpy, but that after that, life can go on very well with the transplant for a long time. It's important to talk to your doctor if you're having a hard time. Prednisone can also cause mood swings, and it's important to talk to the doctor about this or the social worker at the transplant center. It's important not to stop taking medications or to adjust the medications on your own. This could cause you to lose the kidney. The kidney may not go into rejection right away, or it could. Sometimes it may scar the kidney, and the scarring over time can create the problem. So if you're having a problem with medication, talk to the doctor and try to work it out. For the first six months, you may have more meds than this for sure, such as antibiotics, antifungal medications, antiviral medications. Some of these are very costly. There will be blood pressure pills. There may be medications to lower cholesterol and anti-acids or proton pump inhibitors that keep acid reflux from being a problem for you while you're on so many medications. How high is the risk of diabetes? Well, A meta-analysis, and a meta-analysis is when someone looks at many studies. And so a meta-analysis looked at 10 studies of over 2,500 people and found 50% risk of diabetes. Another study found that predictors of diabetes after transplant include obesity before transplant and a family history of diabetes. Trying to manage your lifestyle now before transplant can help you stay healthier and have a good future after transplant. How high is the risk of cancer? Well, we all have some risk, even without a transplant. A study followed 489 people with transplant for many years. 226 of them developed at least one cancer in the next 15 years or so. 171 of that group had a skin cancer, not melanoma. The rest were not skin cancer. Not surprisingly, smoking, being older, and having fair skin raised the risk. It's important to protect yourself as much as possible from skin cancer, such as staying out of the sun during peak times and wearing a hat and sunscreen. You can even buy clothing that blocks the sun. Sometimes, sun and the risk of skin cancer may require you to think about changes in the type of job you were doing prior to the transplant. And sometimes modifications can be made called accommodations to the job that you're doing. But it's very important to think about the risk of cancer and how to protect your skin as you go forward after transplant. Sources of kidneys, living donors. Since healthy people have two kidneys, they can choose to donate one. As we all know, all surgery carries some risk, but the donor is evaluated thoroughly to reduce every known possibility of risk. A donor must have most of the same test as the recipient does. Living donors must be healthy, so they tend to do very well in the long run. However, there's a study from the Netherlands that found higher rates of end-stage renal disease and death in donors after 15 years than in healthy non-donors. And this study was found in Kidney International. A kidney is a gift. It is not something that you can expect from someone else. There are no strings attached once someone becomes a donor. And there will be testing and assessment that tries to help both parties understand that there are no strings attached. It is illegal in the United States to pay a living donor. Some people go to other countries and pay someone to give them a kidney. However, this has many risks, and this is called transplant tourism. 
we find that transplant tourism brings about a higher risk of rejection and severe infection for the recipient. Additionally, long-term payment for the anti-rejection medications for people getting their kidneys through transplant tourism is very difficult. On average, kidneys from living donors do last longer. You can get a kidney before you start dialysis. This is called a preemptive transplant. A preemptive transplant can be done with a living or deceased donor when the recipient's estimated GFR is 20 or below. It's easier to schedule a transplant if you have a living donor because you can agree upon what dates are good and set everything up for yourself and for the donor. Laparoscopic surgery, which is shown in the photo, can be done to remove the kidney from the donor. Gas is used to inflate the belly of the donor so the doctor can see, and the kidney is removed through a small incision in the belly button. Healing is much faster than with the standard donor surgery that was previously used. A living donor can be related or unrelated. An unrelated spouse, neighbor, in-law, or friend can donate a kidney as well. Sometimes you might have a willing donor who is not a match. This person could be asked to be part of a paired exchange. He or she can donate to someone else while another pair, their donor, would donate to you. Chains are groups of exchanges. One altruistic donor gives a kidney, then that person's loved one donates a kidney to another person, and that person's donor gives one to another person, and the chain goes on and on and on. The biggest one so far has been about 60 people. I do warn you that sometimes when we see TV shows that talk about chains of transplant, it does not seem that they do the same evaluation process that real transplant centers do. And the transplant evaluation does take time. It's not usually done as quickly as the TV shows illustrate it to be. I know you know that, but I just had to include it. If you share your story and someone offers a kidney, There is a small potential for harm, but you are also giving them a chance to do something they may feel good about. Sometimes it's hard to think about allowing someone to give such a precious gift to you. Sometimes it takes time to think about it. There are websites that you can share with potential donors. Usually your transplant center will have someone that they can talk to that you might be able to say, you know, I know this is a very serious decision that you're thinking about, and I'd like for you to talk to someone a little bit more about it. I sure appreciate your thinking about it. Or you may be able to just go straight to giving them the connection for the application. There is no right or wrong answer to these questions. The kidney truly is a gift. If someone doesn't offer, on the other hand, it doesn't mean that they don't love you or that they wouldn't do whatever they can for you. They may be afraid. They may not be able to miss work. They may not have child care. They may be afraid that if they have small children and something happens to them, what would happen to their child? Their spouse may be worried about that. They may be worried about their future life, their health disability. One never really knows, but these people who care so much about you can help you in many other ways. Others whom you didn't expect may offer when they know you want a kidney. It's really tricky. Sometimes people don't want to let too many people know that they have kidney disease. Sometimes at work they don't want to let people know. But in the same way as I respect that thought process, you just really never know who might come forward as a kidney donor. So there's a lot to think about, I think, in this one slide. Now we're going to talk about deceased donors. When someone is brain dead, their loved ones can donate their organs. This works best if someone signs a donor card while they are able and speaks to their loved ones to let them know that they want to be a donor. You know which is the United Network for Organ Sharing, is a nonprofit organization which administers the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network that we call OPTN, which was created by Congress in 1984. It keeps the U.S. transplant list, enforces policy, 
and raises awareness. People on the UNOS list get points for their general health, how long a new kidney might last, waiting time on the list, which starts when dialysis does, the antigen match, a perfect match gets priority anywhere in the U.S., age, children and teens get more points, PRA and rare blood type, meaning highly sensitized people or those with type B blood get more points since they are harder to match, and medical urgency, which means there are no more access sites for dialysis. On donation status, prior organ donors get priority. So it is not possible to tell where you are on the list, and it's not a first-come, first-serve. It's a bit complicated to explain to someone about the UNOS waiting list, but I believe at the end of this presentation, there's a note that you can go to www.unos.org and find out a lot more information about UNOS and about transplant. Here are the most recent wait times for deceased donor kidneys by blood type. If you have type AB blood, you can take a kidney from AB, AB, or O, so the wait time may be the shortest. Those with type O blood can take only a type O kidney, so this wait is longer. This points to the idea that if it's possible to have a living donor, once you are accepted by a transplant hospital as a recipient, then the donor can be evaluated and the waiting time looks very different. It's a matter of months usually before a transplant is done. But in terms of deceased donors, you have a choice, or in terms of living donors as well, you have a choice of transplant centers. If there is more than one in your area, visit and talk to them. There are rules for who can get a transplant, and they may differ from one hospital to another. One rule that varies a lot from hospital to hospital is body mass index, BMI, and that relates to a risk of surgery for the recipient, and there may be other rules that vary as well. Additionally, cost may vary due to insurance payment. Sometimes insurance have managed care contracts with certain hospitals and not with others. The other thing you can look at at www.optn.org or get to it through the UNOS website is the success rate at various transplant centers. You can switch from one center to another and your wait time goes with you. You may be able to list in more than one center. Sometimes that's dependent on your insurance. It's not an issue with Medicare. But it is best, if you're going to do that, to list in different areas. The country is divided into organ procurement organizations, and the OPOs, it would be best if you're possibly listed in a different OPO than your home OPO. So that is something that you can consider. Some transplant centers will not accept multiple listed candidates, and if you choose to multiple list, your doctor needs to contact the center so you can be evaluated as a transplant candidate. So there are many options. Sometimes if you're evaluated at one center, they'll be happy with your permission to send some of your results to a different transplant center. The, the different transplant center will definitely want to do some of their own testing, but they may be able to use some of the testing from the first center as well. As I mentioned earlier, each time a kidney comes up, the transplant center calls about three people. There is a time frame in which the organ must be used, and one or two of the people called may have an infection or may have that positive cross match which we discussed. The infection leads to thinking about a good reason to have a fistula or a graft for your access if you use hemodialysis rather than a hemodialysis catheter because a hemodialysis catheter has a much higher risk of infection. And if you have an infection when you're called for transplant, you won't be able to be transplanted because remember the anti-rejection drugs increase your risk of infection and the two together could cause a very serious problem for you. 
Now you, as the patient, can also turn down a particular kidney for personal reasons, like you must attend a special event like a wedding or graduation, or your support person or child care person is away and can't get back, or you might be on a long planned trip and can't make it back in time. However, if you do this too often, the center will talk to you about whether you really want to be on the list at this point in time or not. So a lot of things go into this. You may also turn down a kidney because it's questionable in some way. You can ask about the kidney before you decide to take it. Was it from an older donor? Are the donor's health habits known? Did he or she engage in risky behavior? If a donor is known to be a CDC, Centers for Disease Control, high risk, you must be told. Is a health history available for the donor? So you can ask questions about this when a doctor or the hospital calls you to see if you would be willing to accept a kidney from a deceased donor. It's okay to do that. Transplant surgery itself takes a couple of hours. You'll get a lot of teaching in the hospital before you go home. However, if you've ever been in the hospital before, and if you're like me, you won't be feeling tip-top right after surgery. So it's very important to have someone with you to listen to the same instructions because it's always better to have two heads listen, in my opinion. But they're going to be giving you a lot of new information. So it's always good to have someone there. The medication regimen is complex, and you'll need to know it. The people that are seeing you after you get out of the hospital will review this with you as well, but it's good to have someone with you to support you. The medication regimen may change. It may change the first time you go to clinic. It may change after two weeks. The kidney may also kick in right away, or it may take time. Sometimes the kidney is known as sleepy and it may take time for it to wake up. And occasionally a person has to go to dialysis for some weeks. One time I knew a person, they were on dialysis for 16 weeks before the kidney woke up. And the kidney woke up, and he had that kidney for quite a few years after that. This doesn't happen often, but it does happen. If you can set your expectations that things are probably not going to be perfect, it helps us to adjust and deal with complications that may come. It's going to be important for you to hear what the complications might be to look for. They'll go over this several times and write this down for you. But again, you are very important to the plan of care to report what complications you may be having so that the doctor can help you with your treatment. After the transplant, your immune system is suppressed, and this means that you have to take steps to avoid infection. It's important to wash your hands often and to take food safety steps. Don't be the one to clean the kitty litter box. This is your chance to opt out. Birds and reptiles may carry salmonella, so be careful there, and don't take care of sick people. Avoid live vaccines and people who have had them in the last two weeks. Your new kidney will be in your abdomen where it is less protected. Ask the doctor if contact sports could harm the kidney. You'll get ongoing care from the transplant team or your local doctor, and there will be lots of questions that come up. I suggest that you write them down in a notebook and bring them with you to the transplant clinic and try and get answers. And if you don't get all the answers, I always suggest to write them down in priority and then get answered your most urgent questions and see if you can get them all answered because you will be getting a lot of information. And it's okay sometimes to say, you know, I'm not sure I can absorb any more today. That's okay. Sometimes we at the clinic need to understand that and be reminded of it. You won't be able to lift heavy things right after surgery for a few weeks. This means no more than a gallon of milk, which is about 8 pounds, and driving will be off limits for a while. So it's very important to plan ahead for transportation to and from the clinic, which again will mean several trips to the clinic. At our clinic, there are three appointments a week if everything is going perfectly for three weeks, and then it goes down to two times a week after that if everything is going perfectly, and have backups. So in case your designated driver gets sick 
or can't take off work or has a broken foot, uh, you have a backup plan, somebody ready to help you in case something happens. You'll have a major abdominal incision and some pain. Cooking and cleaning and even walking upstairs will be hard for a few weeks. So if your plan is to stay with someone who has stairs at their house while you're away from home, this could be something that you might want to think about. Plan on how you'll get food and take care of children and other tasks. You will need some help at home, at least at first. Some of the takeaways from our talk today. A transplant is indeed a portable treatment, not a cure. You'll need many tests to qualify for a transplant. You'll need meds to suppress your immune system and will have a higher risk of infection, diabetes, and cancer. Living donors need the same test as you. And after transplant, avoid germs and see your care team to stay happy. A working transplant can be a wonderful thing. It's important to have realistic expectations. And also, be aware that others around you may have expectations of you. A transplant is a change in everyone's life. Talk it out. Try to keep the communications open. Weigh the pros and cons for yourself and think about a potential living donor. If you get a transplant, take good care of your gift. Here are some um, websites. I would like to point out that a couple of the organizations on here, um, Children's Organ Transplant Association, helps with fundraising not only for children, but for adults who have PKD. Um, Help Hope Live and the National Foundation for Transplants are fundraising organizations for adults as well. And these organizations can help you to set aside money uh, for your transplant needs. Um, some other popular organizations out there that people use off the internet keep uh, 10% of the money that is raised, these organizations on this page do not do that. So I would encourage you to contact these organizations if you're applying for transplant uh, and raise money. There will be needs for time off work, for medications, for insurance premiums. So think about that ahead of time. It's really been a pleasure to talk with you today during this webinar. I wish you well on your journey. Thank you.